that you are excited about what we're going to talk about today, and we have with us Lewis White with Low Country Home Inspections. His partner Kevin could not attend today, but um, we'll just set up for Lewis if that's okay. <laughs> Lewis, up to you. Good morning. I am Lewis White. I'm co-owner of Low Country Home Inspection here in Charleston with Kevin Wessendorf. I'm also president of the South Carolina chapter of the American Society of Home Inspectors. Uh, we've been in business for 21 years. You know, we're both local licensed contractors, and we've been in the building business for about 35 years. So we've got a total 70 years of construction experience between the two of us. Uh, we're also both licensed um, or certified ASHI inspectors, and we're master inspectors with the South Carolina Association of Home Inspectors. I would first like to start by thanking Liz Lobo for her gracious invitation to speak to all of you this morning. I would also like to thank all of you who are participating today that showed your commitment to the sales process and keeping your clients' interests first and foremost in the home buying process. Today what we're going to cover are the South Carolina Home Inspector Standards of Practice. This are, these are the guidelines by which we must adhere to perform inspections in the state of South Carolina. Um, the following standards provide guidelines for the home inspectors and outline what a home inspector should observe, identify, inspect, and describe in the inspection report. The guidelines provide the minimal context of a written report and are not intended to limit the residential home inspector. If the inspector wishes to provide additional inspection services not covered in the standards, that's up to each inspector. Now the procedure for home inspection is what we're trying to do is identify what is to be inspected and what's to be reported. The inspector, and the inspector will not disclose any information concerning the results of the inspection without the approval of the clients or their representatives, will not accept compensation, financial or otherwise, from, other, from, from, one, from more than one interested party for the same service without the consent of all interested parties and the inspector will not accept or offer commissions or allowances directly or indirectly from other parties in connection with work for which the inspector is responsible. The inspector will promptly disclose to the client any interest in a business which may affect the client. The inspector will, all, will, will not allow an interest in any business to affect the quality or results of the inspection work which the inspector may be called upon to perform. The inspector may not perform any work or improvements on a residence upon which the inspector performed a home inspection within the previous 12 months. In other words, a lot of people have been asking us, can't you go ahead and do the work? But we cannot do any work on anything that we inspect for at least 12 months. So that keeps us out of the construction business. The purpose of the residential inspection is to disclose, disclose the general conditions of the building, improvements, mechanical systems, and appliances as they exist on the day of the inspection. The scope of the residential inspection is a visual observation with limited use of mechanical instruments of readily accessible areas of the building, improvements, mechanical systems, and appliances. The inspection is limited to areas and systems identified as follows grounds and appurtenances, roofing, guttering, and other roof components, home exteriors, garage and carport, electrical, basement and crawl space, and slab, plumbing, heating, cooling, the attic, general interiors, and kitchen and appliances. What we're trying to provide for you is a, a general report of everything to which we have access. We're not specialists in any one particular field. Uh, being contractors, we have dealt with all, all the fields, but we're just trying to give you a general condition of everything that we see on the day of the inspection. The residential inspector standards are designed to identify and disclose observed general conditions only. The residential inspection is limited to readily accessible areas. No disassembly of equipment or activation of equipment that has been shut down should be performed. 
And today we see a lot of houses that have been uh, winterized. If we go to do an inspection, all of these things, all of these systems have to be turned on for us because we don't know if they were just turned off because they were winterized or whether there was a problem with any of these systems. So we rely heavily on real estate agents or the owners or whoever is in charge of the property to turn these systems on for us so we don't damage anything when they come in to do an inspection. So really, uh, Lewis, you're saying that if the house is vacant and the electricity and all that's been turned off, then you are expecting the agent to have that turned back on? Well, it helps the inspection process. Um, we want to be able to go through the house and look at everything to which we have access. That includes all your electrical, plumbing, heating, and air. And um, if everything has been shut off, and like I said, we don't know whether it was shut off for winterization or if there was a problem, so we, we're relying heavily on the agents to have all these systems turned on for us, including the gas, so that we can check everything. Without that, we're only doing part of our um, inspection, and if we have to come back, then it's another trip, and it's, it just gets more expensive that way, and it's a lot less expensive. We, we can get everything inspected on the day of the inspection. Um, there are no warranties or guarantees in the inspection process. Now, a lot of uh, inspectors have gone out of their way to enlist certain warranty companies, and they're selling warranties, but the, the inspector cannot uh, warrant or guarantee anything. Um, and that, that's according to the state standards? According to the state standards. The residential inspection report is not intended to be used as a guarantee or a warranty, either as expressed or implied regarding adequacy, performance, condition of any inspected building improvements, mechanical systems, or appliances. And we should take uh, no position on giving anything any value. And a lot of, a lot of people ask us, well, what do you think this is worth, or what do you think it's going to cost to fix it? Um, we're not real estate agents, although some of us are contractors. If you want a cost to repair, we could formulate something for you after the inspection process. Um, it's just getting into another, uh, another, or wearing another hat, so to speak. Um, we, we're wearing our inspection hat when we're doing the inspections for you. If you want costs, then we're going to have to put on our, our uh, contractor's hat and, and give you those costs as asked for. Um, the licensing requirements for persons engaging in the business of inspection practice. A state license is required for anyone offering or practicing home inspection unless that individual is a currently licensed engineer, architect, general contractor, or residential contractor. This is based on Chapter 106, Statutory Authority, 1976 Code, 40-59-210. We're going to get started on some of the components that are covered. Uh, and what we have to report and how it's to be reported. Uh, we'll start with roofing. We have to identify the stoop, the style of the roof, and this is uh, giving the uh, potential buyer an indication of what type of roof it is. Is it a gable roof, a hip roof, a mansard roof, flat, or what have you, and the roof type or, or roof coverings involved, whether it's a shingles, metal, fiberglass, it could be a host of these things. And uh, we want to look at all the visual uh, flashings of the roof as well, because this is what keeps the inside of the house from getting wet. Flashings of all uh, penetrating areas through the roof. And we're thinking, of, in that term, we're thinking of vent pipes or dormers or chimneys or skylights, anything of that nature that penetrates the roof. Those have to be flashed properly. Without that flashing, they're going to leak. And I know many of you have seen uh, stains and ceilings and so forth, so this is what keeps everything dry. Um, another portion of the roof are gutters and downspouts. We want to make sure that uh, these things are properly secured to the building, that they're clean of debris. Um, if you have guttering that's full of debris, it can back up, it can back up onto the roof. Um, it won't drain properly. You can get uh, moisture penetration uh, on the roof and even at the foundation wall. Um, some of the limitations for, and as much as roofing is concerned, we don't want to perform a task that puts us in danger. So if we, someone asks us to do a, uh, a, a, 
virtual or a, uh, a roof inspection where we have to get up on it. Uh, we don't want to climb on any steep roofs because we're just not equipped for that. And we don't, there, there are certain types of roofs on which we cannot climb. Um, certainly one of them was uh, the old asbestos roofing. Um, if you step on that or a tile roofing, it, it will break and will ultimately fall. So we don't want to put ourselves in uh, any type of danger. Some people are saying they have a hard time hearing, so just speak louder. Okay. <clears throat> um, in the event that we can't get on the roof, then we're going to inspect the roof from the ground with binoculars. Um, that's probably the most prevalent way to do it. Uh, if, uh, if we have a one-story house that it's easy to get on, then it's easy to get up on the roof and look at everything. And it really helps us to get up on the roof to look at the condition of it. Because a lot of things you cannot see from the ground. Um, if we have a chance where we, um, if the roof is too steep, hopefully there's an adjoining a wall or a balcony or a dormer out of which we can climb so we can get a good idea of what kind of condition the roof is in. And what we're looking for are broken shingles, worn shingles, uh, a lot of the granular surface starting to uh, come off. And this really tells us the age of the shingles. Uh, most of your pre tab shingles are only going to last 15 to 17 years in this area. Um, the heavier shingles, the architect shingles, are going to last 20 to 25 years. But it all depends on how well the roof is ventilated, um, and what kind of condition you keep it in. You don't want to leave uh, debris lying on the roof because this can grow weeds, in some cases even small trees growing in valleys or gutters, which can eventually eat through the roof and cause a lot of severe damage. Um, if we can get on the roof, then we have to mention that in the report and state why. Uh, that's very important. If, uh, if somebody says he can't get on a roof, he needs to indicate so in the report why he can't do it. And we do that in all of our inspections. And that holds true for any aspect of the house. If we can't get to a certain area, then we are to, to disclose to the public or to the client or to the realtor that we can't get to that area and disclose why. And in our case, we take pictures of the areas to which we cannot uh, inspect. So. Everybody's on, on board. Everybody's on the same page. Uh, the next part we want to go through is the interior, the exterior trim. We want to look at the, all the materials and describe and report any defects. Um, this includes um, siding wall coverings, uh, brick veneer, paint, windows. We've got to describe, describe everything. Uh, that way we know what type of material it is and the buyer knows what type of material it is. So we can give them some idea on what type of um, maintenance they're going to have to perform on it um, regularly and how long the materials are going to last. Also, we have to report on the doors, any and all storm windows and storm doors, screens, porches, decks, and any other alterations that may have been added or removed from the house. And all these things we have to report if they are there and what kind of condition they're in. Um, same thing holds true for the garage. We have to report uh, if it's present or not, what type of style, size, location, whether it's uh, one car, two car, multi car, whether it's detached, attached, and so forth. Uh, and we want to look at all aspects of the garage, the door openers, if they're operating properly, doors, windows, ceilings, walls, floors. Uh, the whole gamut. Um, the only thing that we may not be able to do is operate something that has been uh, de-energized or is not um, electrified. Uh, in that case, or if something's locked or padlocked up, we don't have the right to come in and take padlocks off or, or remove anything or plug anything in, anything in that was not previously energized. So we, we can't operate anything unless it is operable. Um, on the electrical portion, we need to identify and report the type of electrical protection they have in the house. Uh, in other words, breakers or fuses. Um, see what the visible condition is and describe any defects we have. Um, we have to look at the different types of conductors, main and branch circuits, uh, 
the most important thing to do is uh, make sure that these breakers are and the wiring attached to them uh, are, are attached firmly. In other words, we don't want to find any loose wires where something could be arcing. Uh, one of the biggest problems we see are uh, some double tapping of some breakers. Uh, these can become loose. They can come loose and fall out inside the panel box. They can hit the uh, exterior of the panel box and cause a, an arc or cause a fire. So you don't want anything double tapped. And that holds true for your uh, neutral wires as well. You don't want any of those double tapped. And the reason for this is simple. The manufacturer of the panel states inside the panel that these things cannot be double tapped. So if, if, the, if it states so inside the panel, and these are the manufacturer's installation instructions, they supersede the code. If there's nothing in the code about this, then the manufacturer's installation instructions supersede it. Uh, we need to make sure that we identify uh, the incoming service, what type of wire it is, how, how large it is, the same thing on wiring for the house, what type of wiring it is. Um, there are several things inside the panel that, for which we're looking. Uh, one of the big things is uh, bushings, where the wire comes through the top of, or bottom of the panel, and if you don't have a bushing in place, the raw metal from the cutout in the top or bottom of the panel can chafe the wire, cut through the wire, and cause a shock, a shock or an arc or even a fire. Um, we need to make sure that everything is properly grounded and that the ground wire is properly attached to the ground rod. The reason for that is that if you have a lightning strike, then you want the lightning to go into the ground and not follow the course through the house, uh, damaging any type of electrical equipment, whether it's appliances, TVs, what have you. Uh, if you don't have it grounded properly, and you do have a lightning strike, this will certainly happen. Um, another thing we're looking for are ground fault circuit interrupters. And these are... What did you say? Ground fault circuit interrupters, GFCIs for short. And these are placed on the kitchen countertops, the bath countertops, garages, and exteriors. And in the, uh, now they're requiring them in the areas of the heating and air conditioning systems on the exterior of the house. And this just prevents um, shock or, or something of this nature. Um, something new that's coming up or, or something new that is in place today are arc fault protection. And this is located in all the bathrooms. And when the 2009 electrical code comes in to effect and is adopted by the municipalities, virtually everything will have to be on an arc fault. Smoke detectors, every switch, every outlet, everything in the house. And we had talked to uh, the people who had written the code about this and asked them to change some of these things, and they're not going to change anything. So there, there will be some getting used to uh, of some of these things that perhaps a smoke detector goes off, it may trip the, the breaker, the arc breaker, arc pole breaker, and you'll have to go back and reset it at the breaker itself, at the breaker box. Um, some of the limitations for the inspectors, we're not required to put any type of tool or probe or testing device inside the main or sub panels. We cannot activate any electrical system that has, not, has been shut off. Um, I'm sorry, can we go back for one second? People would like to know um, what was that you just talked about, the new thing. They want you to repeat the new system. Arc fault breakers. Uh, they have been required since 2006 in all the bedrooms of the houses, of new houses today. And what that provides is fire protection if you're using a an outlet in the bedroom and uh, you have an arc there, it will trip the breaker and shut the power off. And this is primarily a fire protection item. Uh, I had mentioned that it's coming out in the 2009 code, which has not been adopted by any municipalities at this time, but there 
thinking is to put everything on a arc bolt breaker in the house. Um, again, this is going to have to be adopted by the municipalities, and every municipal inspector will interpret the code that he sees uh, best for his community. I really think that some of them might have a little trouble with your southern accent. <laughs> so the arc fault, one person said, did, did he say R4? That's arc, A-R-C, fault, F-A-U-L-T, arc fault. Um, if you don't, if you can't understand my Charleston brogue, I apologize for it. You know, I just got out of the board yesterday and I had some shrimp last night for dinner. Um, in as much as operating certain things in the house, uh, we have to operate all the GFCI um, receptacles in the house, whether they're in the kitchen, the bathroom, exterior garage, we have to operate every one of them. And sometimes this takes time simply because they'll have a master uh, GFI breaker in the panel box or one located somewhere in the house to reset all of these. And it takes time to run back and forth to check all of them. And there's usually a dozen of them in the house. Um, we try to check and test all of the switches, all of the receptacles, all of the fixtures that we have access to. If we are not, if it is not accessible, we're not going to operate it. But we will tell you that we cannot get to all, excuse me, all of the receptacles or all of the switches. Um, we're also not required to operate a smoke detector by any means other than what is supplied by the manufacturer. Uh, we just want to make sure that they are there and they are operating. And it's best to check these things quarterly and replace the batteries, the 9-volt batteries in them quarterly, because the new smoke detectors are both hardwired and battery backed up. So you need to check check your 9-volt batteries in there. If they start to squawk or chirp, it's time for a new battery. So make sure that you replace these on a regular basis, almost the same time you replace your filters in your HVAC systems. Um, any other questions? We'll move on. Uh, next section is basement, crawl space, and slab. Uh, we're just supposed to report their presence and their condition. Um, in the case of a crawl space, a lot of the crawl spaces in the Charleston area are very tight. Um, we'll try to get to every area if it is accessible. Uh, I know that on several occasions I've gone to some houses where there was a waistline right in front of the crawl space access, which made it impossible for me to get in. I'm a small guy. I need. I still need about 12 to 14 inches to get uh, underneath the house. Um, if we can't get to a certain location, then we need to tell the buyer or tell the agent and put it in the report that we cannot get to a certain area in the crawl space or basement, whether it's ductwork, water lines, gas lines, waste lines, whatever. We have to tell you why we can't get to that area. But we try to get to every area in the crawl space so that we can give you a, a, a good overview of the condition they're in. Um, we need to report all the different types of framing, all of your floor joists, all of your subflooring, the foundation walls, what type of walls they are, and uh, what the uh, what the what type of floor is in the crawl space or slab, whether it's dirt, gravel, concrete, or what have you. Um, if there is a sump pump in place and if it is operational. Um, some of the limitations to a crawl space is, like I said, we're not required actually to enter a crawl space if it is less than 18 inches. And I've done that on probably thousands of occasions. Um, uh, another limitation would be that if, uh, if the crawl space or, or basement was flooded. We're not required to go in there because the last thing I want to do is get electrocuted. Um, we're supposed to uh, determine where, where the extent of any type of damage except for uh, 
insect damage. We're not licensed pest control operators, so therefore we do not report on termites. However, if there is damage, we will report the damage therein. Um, the next section we're going to cover is plumbing. Uh, we need to identify all different types of visible water piping, all the visible waste piping, uh, the water supply, the disposal system, whether it's municipal or a septic tank. And a lot of people are asking if we can do septic tank inspections. Uh, we can provide that through a subcontractor. The only way to inspect a septic tank is to uncover it. And I do not keep a backhoe in my backyard. Lewis, that brings up a question in my mind. On the, you just said whether it's uh, municipal or septic. Does that mean that we've had problems with people, owners saying their house was on um, city sewer or the water, when really it wasn't. So if they have a home inspect, all home inspectors have to tell people that? Is that part of the requirements? Well, what we're looking for is some type of disclosure from the agent to let us know. A lot of times it will be you in your uh, listing agreement or MLS or, or what have you, whether it's in, uh, whether it has a municipal waste hookup or it's on the septic tank. So we're relying heavily on, on the agents for that. Uh, most of your municipal areas have uh, municipal waste service and only some of the outlying areas or islands are on septic tanks. Um, we have had situations where subdivisions were city water and sewer, but there'd be maybe one house that didn't hook in on over subdivisions. But would that be something that you would catch as an inspector? I don't mean to put you on the spot, but this is an issue that we've had. Um, a lot of cases we'll find areas where they have hooked up to the uh, municipal waste system but still have a septic tank in the backyard. And we'll find that simply because there'll be a cave-in or there'll be some wastewater coming out of it. Um, certainly we want to disclose that uh, to the owner or to the client so they can be made aware of it because we don't want to leave anything um, not inspected, and it could be potentially dangerous for the client. Um, one thing about septic tanks you, you need to know is that they need to be pumped out about every three to five years. So if you're selling a property that has a septic tank, you need to make sure that the prior owner discloses to you when it was last pumped out. That's one thing we're asking a lot. Um, uh, another thing that we're finding in yards are uh, buried oil tanks from old oil furnaces. And we have to disclose that as well because these old oil tanks over the years will rust and will cave in. And what we what we like to do or have done in the past is to get them in touch with a, an environmental engineer so they can come out and survey it and tell them exactly what they need to do and correct the problem. Um, Getting back to plumbing, we need to identify the uh, water shutoff and its location. Um, we identify the water heater, what kind of condition it's in, what type of water heater it is. And one of the biggest um, defects we find today are some of the newer water heaters that, that have been installed or replaced since 1999 or 2000 are not strapped in place. And a lot of plumbers will use just galvanized strapping to strap it in place. This is not an approved method for strapping the water heater. There is a specific type of strap that is used for strapping these water heaters, uh, especially in the Charleston area or Somerville area, because we're in a seismic zone. That is the reason for putting the straps on, so they don't fall over, um, especially for gas units, because they can not only dump the water, but they could explode. Um, another big uh, uh, defect that we find are uh, they're not putting on expansion tanks. Expansion tanks have been required on all new replacement water heaters. So you say expansion tanks. An expansion tank is a tank that is fitted to the top of the unit in front of 
the uh, supply valve so that if the pressure gets too great, it can go into the tank instead of exploding the water heater itself. But they have been required, and they have to be sized properly as well. A 50-gallon water heater will require a 2.5-gallon expansion tank. A 80-gallon or 120-gallon water heater will require a 4 to 6-gallon expansion tank. You can't put too small a unit too large a water heater. It will not work properly. We're also looking at all the faucets, all the drains, all the waste lines, um, reporting adequate water pressure, um, all of your showers and fixtures, washer and dryer connections, and uh, another thing we're looking at is um, the condition of waste ejection systems. In other words, you may have a, a waste pump or a grinder pump. Now, in a lot of cases, we'll be a, contacting a, a uh, plumber or a, well, basically a plumber or a, a sewer engineer to describe uh, the condition of these grinder pumps. Um, this is something that we do not normally do. I've never heard of a grinder pump. Uh, a grinder pump is used in a lot of subdivisions like um, maybe Beresford Hall where the house is more than 100 yards or so from the um, tie-in to the waste system. In other words, they have to have a pump that pumps it to it. It's like a small lift station that grinds up the debris or waste and then injects it to the, uh, the tie-in at the uh, waste system. So these are other, other things that we have to um, recognize, and if, we want, if, it's, if it's beyond our purview, then we'll refer it to a plumber. Um, the next section is heating and cooling. Uh, we have to uh, tell you what type of uh, fuel it is, whether it's gas or oil or electric or what have you. Uh, report the type of equipment and operate the for the observed conditions of the thermostat. Uh, we're, we're, we also report the BTU hour rating. In other words, we want to tell you how large the system is, uh, whether it's uh, 70,000 BTUs, 100,000 BTUs, or whether it's 3 tons or 6 tons or what have you. We're also looking at the dis uh, distribution aspect of the heating and air conditioning system. This is your duct work, and we have to describe <clears throat> excuse me, what type of ductwork it is, where it's located, and its condition. Uh, this is another problem area we see in a lot of homes today, especially with ductwork in the crawl states. Uh, we're looking to make sure that the ductwork is properly secured to the trunk lines, the trunk lines are properly secured to the units. In a lot of cases, a lot of people do not go into the crawl space and do not know the condition of their ductwork. In a lot of cases, some of these duct, some some pieces of the ductwork can fall apart, and you can be heating and cooling your crawl space and or your attic. So you need to make sure that you get these items uh, regularly checked by a local heating and air company. Um, we need to look at all of the vents, uh, all of the filters, and what type they are, and if there's any type of um, supplementary heat in the house. A lot of times there will be auxiliary heat systems and bathrooms. And we need to make sure those are operating properly. If not, then they need to be uh, discussed in the report. Some of the limitations for heating and air conditioning, we're not required to dismantle the system. In other words, we're not going to take panels off. We do not carry pouches of tools <coughs> with which to do this. So we don't disassemble anything. We just want to operate it, make sure it's operating properly, um, Visually observe it, tell you what type it is, and if it's functioning properly. Are you going to tell the uh, client and the agents whether it is a heat pump or forced air? Yes, ma'am. We will discuss whether it's a heat pump, forced air, or whether it's a uh, uh, just a cooling system outside. A lot of cases when you have uh, gas heat or oil heat, you'll use a condensing unit in conjunction with it. But we will get 
give you a condition of all of these items as well. Uh, one of the prevalent things in this area is the condition of the coils on the outside units, the compressors. With so much salt air here, the salt reacts badly with the aluminum pins and copper pins. They just deteriorate. And a lot of houses that are on front beach properties, these pins will uh, totally disintegrate within five to seven years. So a lot of times these things are in need of repair every five years or so. Um, Lewis, on our MLS, and then sidetracking just a little bit, on our MLS form, it, it asks the agents to put down whether it's forced air, you know, electric heat, or heat pump. I've always cautioned my people not to put heat pump, even if the seller tells them it's a heat pump. Is there some easy way for an agent to tell if it's a heat pump or just forced air? Yes, ma'am. There are two ways to find out. Um, in most cases, on the condensing unit outside, it will state that it's a heat pump. <clears throat> However, if you go inside and look at the thermostat, and it has on it um, emergency heat, it is a heat pump. That oh, is one that's, of the, that's one of the quickest ways to find out. That's great information. Um, the next section we want to get into is the attic. Uh, first thing is access to the attic. We need to report if it was entered, why or why not. Um, a lot of attic spaces are very difficult uh, to enter simply because they were put in areas uh, where there was very little access or the area above the attic access is very limited. Um, I had <clears throat> seen many of them. We, we, we would literally have to crawl through on our stomachs to get through the attic, and this is virtually impossible. Uh, we want to look at the insulation type and its approximate depth, and this will give us the R value and tell you whether the house should be uh, insulated better or if the insulation needs to be spread better. We need to discuss the type of ventilation there is in the attic, whether it's a ventilator fan, whether it's um, a red vent, soffit vent, uh, or forced air vent. Um, also, we're also always looking at the framing, whether it's conventional framing, and whether it's, uh, it has any damage from leaks or rot or what have you, and also uh, roof trusses. Um, roof trusses have become prevalent throughout the building industry. Uh, these are engineered products, so they cannot be altered in any way whatsoever without the uh, express um, of the truss engineer who developed them. The simple thing about a truss, it was developed and engineered to cover a specific span. And that's why you can't alter these things. Um, a lot of times there is some damage to uh, trusses when they are delivered to jobs because uh, a lot of the web members can come loose, the gusset plates can come loose, and in a lot of cases they, they are altered by other subcontractors, especially heating and air contractors who will just cut through some of the web members. Um, these are the things that we're looking for. Uh, anything that was out of the norm. Um, and like I said, trusses are, are engineered products. So if there is a repair, it has to be done by an engineer. In other words, he will provide the methodology for repair. Uh, you can't have a contractor come up and just uh, repair these on his own knowledge. Since they are engineered products, they have to be engineered for repairs. Um, some of the limitations for the attic spaces are, are areas where we cannot get uh, simply due to headroom, ductwork, gas lines, water lines, waste lines, much the same as a crawl space. So if we do not get to an area, we have to report that. Uh, we'll get into some of the general interior. What we're looking at is the conditions of the walls, floors, ceilings, stairs, doors, and windows. And we, what we want to do is operate a, a sample of them 
what I try to do is operate everyone to which I have access. Um, it's not uncommon that uh, not all windows are going to operate properly. Some of them may be painted shut, some are just stuck shut, and we have to um, put that in our report as well. We want to let everyone know that um, the windows are, certain windows are operational, which ones are not, and which ones need some type of uh, repair. Uh, also, we need to look at and identify um, the observed condition of fireplaces. Um, two different types of fireplaces. Um, the pre-made fireplace inserts or masonry fireplaces. Um, all fireplaces should be cleaned on an annual basis. There can be a, um, a accumulation of soot or or resin in the uh, flues, and this material is flammable. So all of this needs to be removed. You should have any fireplace uh, cleaned by a chimney sweep, and I mean a licensed chimney sweep on a regular basis, especially if you're using your fireplace to a great degree. Um, other types of fireplaces are your gas fireplaces. Um, Gas fireplaces are very prevalent in today's new homes. A lot of them are ventless. Um, you need to look at your installation instructions for use of these fireplaces if they are unvented. If you have an unvented fireplace, it will state in the um, instructions for use that you should have at least a window and a door open for cross ventilation because there is no place for the you know, combustion elements to escape. Um, this is the opposite of fluid chimneys or masonry chimneys, which have a fluid which draw all the combustion elements to the exterior. So you want to make sure that you're operating this thing properly. The newer uh, fireplaces, the gas uh, ventless fireplaces are What's the word I'm looking for? Uh, equipped with oxygen sensors. And these oxygen sensors will alert you when the oxygen levels become too low for anyone in the house. If you have oxygen uh, depletion that is below 20% or 16%, these sensors will go off and it will automatically shut off a lot of the newer fireplaces. Uh, this is the big problem with unvented gas fireplaces is that they produce so much carbon monoxide it will literally knock you out, make you unconscious, and you can die from it. And there have been several reports of these throughout the country. So you need to make sure that these things are operating properly. Um, one of the big limitations on the interior, we can't go around moving furniture. We're not furniture movers, and the last thing I want to do is hurt myself so I can't continue the inspection. So we don't uh, move furniture. We don't light fireplaces, uh, whether they're gas or masonry, um, unless the gas is on. Um, one question is um, about the uh, gas fireplaces and stuff. Lisa Donahoe asks, could the guy who puts gas in the tank help with answering questions about the vents? Would they be knowledgeable enough to answer those questions? Not necessarily. You need the installers to tell you or uh, have the installer leave the operating instructions for you. Um, the gas supplier is not going to tell you that. He is just there to uh, bring in the gas or sell you a system. Any other questions? Um, I have that, one, but I'm going to wait to the end. Okay. Next section is kitchen and appliances. We want to identify uh, the fuel source, whether it's electric or gas, um, give you a general overview of the uh, conditions of the cabinets, the stove or range, oven, uh, disposal, uh, dishwasher, uh, fan, fan hood. And uh, one of the biggest things we see are people cooking on gas stoves without any type of exterior ventilation from their vent, from their fan hood. Anytime you're cooking with gas, 
there should be a fan hood that is ducted to the exterior. A lot of cases they're just using recycling um, fans in either the uh, uh, microwave or a self-standing or, or self-installed um, uh, vent hood. But uh, anytime you cook with gas, it should be vented to the exterior. Um, we're not required to calibrate temperatures or determine uh, if, a hub, uh, if an oven is heating properly. We don't carry uh, thermometers to stick in the oven. Uh, we don't de uh, determine any efficiency of any equipment. Uh, we don't determine any remaining life of any equipment in the kitchen. Although the, most of your dishwashers, uh, refrigerators, stoves, they have a life expectancy probably of about 10 to 15 years. After that, they're, they're becoming a little obsolete. Um, and then it's time to look at uh, purchasing a new one when these things start to break down and not operate properly. Um, okay. Some of the, go ahead. We have a question here from Deborah Webster. It says, did you say that you do check all of the windows and doors, are you just spot check? I mean, in general, what should an inspector do, not you specifically? Generally, an inspector is supposed to inspect a sampling of all the windows and doors if they're operating properly. Uh, for me personally, I like to operate all of them so I can point out the ones that are not operating properly. There may be some with broken seals, there may be some broken glass. Um, there may be some broken sash balancers. And your sash balancers are the you know, spring-loaded portion of the window in the jam that keeps the window up once it's raised. In other words, it keeps it from falling. And this, is, uh, this can be a very dangerous thing. If you have large um, uh, thermopane windows and you raise them and they fall, as soon as you raise them, the, the glass can shatter. And if somebody's in the wrong place at the wrong time, they can be they can be harmed by this. So these are one of the most important things you need to be aware of are the the balancers in the windows, uh, simply because of that that um, the damage that can occur. We have another question asking you to go back and repeat how how an agent can tell the difference in a forced air and heat pump? Forced air is basically um, provided by gas furnaces. This is a forced air furnace. Um, the difference between electric furnaces and heat pumps is the emergency heat feature. Um, also, if you look inside the condensing unit, there is a large reversing valve in that. Now, let's be realistic. How many real estate agents are going to look inside there? Nobody's going to look inside a, right. a condensing unit. But if your thermostat has an emergency heat um, setting on it, uh, the likelihood is great that it is a heat pump. Okay. Another question. What if that... Um, Thermostat has been upgraded to digital. Then how do we tell? Even the new digital ones will have emergency settings on them. Good information. Um, like I said in the beginning, we're only supposed to report the the general conditions of the residence. Uh, it does not get into uh, pools or uh, outbuildings unless these outbuildings are um, powered or have water run to them and have their own heating and air units. Um, this gets into almost another inspection. Uh, in some cases you may have um, a dependency on some of these older buildings down, downtown where they have an apartment that is uh, part of the uh, residence that we're required to inspect those. If it is a just a shop or something of that nature, unless it has power run to it, we don't inspect it. 
A lot of uh, residences just have sheds in the backyard. We're not required to inspect those. That is a departure from what uh, we normally do. If you want it inspected, you can ask the inspector to do so. It would be left up to him to make this decision. Um, let's see. Advertisements for home inspectors. Um, advertisements include, but are not limited to, inspection reports, business cards, invoices, signs, purchase telephone directory displays, and advertising by newspapers. If someone is holding himself out as a home inspector, he has to have all of these items. Um, if he's not a home inspector, displaying uh, business cards or licenses, then he's not probably a properly licensed home inspector. Um, advertisements by a person licensed as an inspector should contain the inspector's name, the business name, address, and license number of the inspector. And the commissioner may reprimand, suspend, or revoke the license of a person who is found to have engaged in false or misleading advertising or who have failed to comply with the provisions of the advertising section. Uh, as I had said earlier, an inspector can exclude from the ins inspection report any component or system which the inspector is not competent or qualified to inspect. And any exclusion should be disclosed in the report. Um, we are finding more and more today that people are requesting pre-drywall inspections on new homes. So this would be a departure from the whole home inspection because since the house is not finished, we're only reporting on the things that we can see, mainly the uh, electrical wiring that is installed, the uh, HVAC, the plumbing, and the wall systems and floor systems themselves. That brings a, a question that one of the Lisa Dunaho asked, how important do you think it is to have a new construction newly constructed home inspected? Uh, in, in of course he's going to say it's important. My personal view, and having built a, a, been a builder for 35 years, I think it's very important. Uh, the reason for this is that the builder cannot be on the job all day, every day, holding all of the subcontractors' hands and making sure they know what they're doing. Um, he's relying heavily on the subcontractors to do their job and do it efficiently and proficiently. But uh, in, in a lot of cases, a lot of the trades uh, following one another will dismantle or damage some of the previous trades' work. Um, so I, I think it's very important that, that new houses be inspected. Uh, the, the, the builder cannot see and does not see the municipal inspector cannot see and does not have the time to look at everything, so it's very important to have this done. Uh, a lot of cases, uh, the, the more prevalent damage we found are in the attic structures and the crawl, crawl space structures because something hasn't been nailed on right or they left off a hanger for a floor joist or in some cases the whole house has not been strapped down and you're relying heavily on that, that contract to make sure all that is done. And in most cases, he hasn't been back to check up behind the subcontractors, unless he is only building one house a year. Very good point. Uh, can we look at a couple pictures now? Sure. You might tell them, this is uh, some photographs from an inspection. Uh, this is a, uh, a picture of porch beams. And if you look closely at the circle on the right, you'll see that the beam is is not fully supported by the post, although it's bolted on. And if you look at the outside beam, there's a joint in it, so it's not being supported properly. The same thing holds true on the left circle. There's a joint in the beam, and that is just prob probably not fastened properly. So these are structural issues because they're not being supported properly. Here you have a picture of a joint in the uh, roof decking. Uh, roof decking is supposed to break at the joints on top of a rafter. Uh, 
Uh, this area becomes a weak portion in the roof. If someone were to step on this, it could break free. So any area that has a joint has to be supported, um, especially laterally when these joints are running the same direction as the rafters. When you look at other joints that run perpendicular to them, this is normal. But uh, a lateral joint, and you can see that they've added some plywood clips, those little silver clips at the joint, this is not enough to hold it in place. It has to be supported by a rafter. Uh, this is a picture of a patio. Uh, the patio looks like it, is, it will not drain properly. The grade of the yard is higher than the patio, so the water will cool here. So you need to make sure that these things are not only graded properly, you need to make sure that the grade of the yard around them is such that the water can drain off them in a, in a positive direction. Um, in a lot of cases, the uh, rainwater can stand in the yard for up to 48 hours. If it's standing in the yard for more than 48 hours, there's a problem with the drainage because simply uh, most of the water will leach through the ground. Get back to these are some uh, wiring issues. If you look at the top right photo uh, where the wiring uh, goes through the top of the uh, panel box, these are where bushings are needed. A bushing is what protects the wiring as it passes through these cutouts or knockouts in the top of the box. So this is what protects the wire from chafing, and if the wire is chafed, then you can have a short or a fire. Uh, the picture on the left shows a lot of the neutral and ground wires lugged together and or some double tapping of the breakers. Um, double tapping uh, can result in, uh, uh, in improperly secured lugs or uh, to the wiring. It could fall out and you could have a short. Uh, the same thing holds true for uh, lugging together your neutral and ground wires, those should be separated simply because it states so in the bottom of the panel, and that's what the other arrow was pointing to at the bottom right picture, that there is a statement in the panel box stating that the neutral and ground wires cannot be lugged together. Uh, the reason for it, it states it in the manufacturer's installation instructions, and also the neutral wire carries a little bit of voltage where it could heat up the lug and the wire could back out fall out and you have a short. Lewis, this has been wonderful. We need to sort of wrap up if you can. <clears throat> um, you can get a copy of the South Carolina Home Inspector Standards of Practice at www.schomeinspector.com. Um, a lot of the new inspectors today are ASHI inspectors. Um, the Standards of Practice on ASHI can be found at uh, ashi.org, or if you want to go to my website, www.lowcountryhomeinspection.com, and hit the tab for About Us, it will bring up uh, ASHI standards and state standards, and you can get it from there. Give us the um, web address again for the standards you get, www. The Web address for the South Carolina Home Inspector Standards of Practice is www.schomeinspector, and that inspector is singular, .com. Anybody can go on, on the web and find these. Very good. Well, thank you very much. We really appreciate you coming, Lewis. Thank you. Hope to do it again soon. Bye, everybody. Have a great week.